All right, let me try that again. Um, hello, I'm Professor Ouellette, and I'm filling in for Professor DeSalvo today and on Friday. Um, I'd just like to uh, first talk about um, searching today. So um, we're going to look at two different types of searching. Try to search for items in a collection that is unsorted and searching for items in a collection that are sorted. So um, let's get started. So the simplest way of finding something in a collection is to just check every element in the collection one by one, starting with the beginning element in like an array or a vector at index 0, and then testing if the given element or the current element is equal to the target of the thing you're trying to search for. Okay? So you basically just start at the beginning and then just check every element one by one until you find the target if the target exists in your collection. Okay? So that's called a linear or sequential search. Okay? Um, now, you might get lucky. In the best case, the thing that you're looking for is in index 0, the first thing you look for, in which case the algorithm uh, is at best O of 1, or constant time. Because all you have to do is make one comparison, and you found it. Game over. You return the index of that particular element to indicate that you found the target element. Okay? So it tells you the return type should be of type unsigned int or int to indicate the index where this element first occurs in your collection. Okay? Um, now think of the worst case scenario. It's um, the case where either it's not, in the <laughs> it's not in the collection at all, or it's the last element of your collection, in which case you have to visit every single element in order. And if your array has size n or your collection has size n elements, then you have to make um, a number of statements. Uh, um, essentially, if you're counting the number of visits, you have to visit all n elements of the array. So you have to make n comparisons. So at worst, linear search is O of n, or linear time. Okay? Now, um, for any other situation, uh, on average, if you take a look at what are the possibilities, um, if you have your best case possibility, you make one comparison um, or one visit. Um, your next best case, you make two visits. And then you keep going, all of the possibilities um, the worst case being n visits, right? Um, if you take all of those uh, number of statements and you average them, right, then you know a formula for this. This is n times n plus 1 over 2. And then we divide this quantity by n so that n's cancel. And the number of comp statements you have to make on average is n plus 1 over 2, OK? Or n over 2 if you don't care about constants. So the big O of this, this is big O of n over 2. Okay, so on average, you're going to visit about half the size of the elements. So half the size of the elements, um, and you will either find your element or not. Yeah, you'll, if you find your element, it'll be, on average, O of n over 2, which is O of n. So in general, the algorithm for linear search is O of n. There's only one case where it performs better, the best case scenario. But you can never expect that to always be the case. <laughs> um, so. So here's an example of trying to find the number 5 in this collection of integers, which is unsorted. Okay? So all you do is iterate through the collection. You start at 7, which is the element index 0. Is 5 equal to 7? No. So I go to the next element. 5 is not equal to 45. So I move on to 65. And then I move on to 8. No dice. I go to 8, 7, 9. Finally, I find my target element, and I return the index um, where 5 appears. So that occurs at index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it'll return 6, the index of the element 5. Okay? But notice we actually loop through half of, about half of the elements, right? So um, if we look at the code for linear search, um, notice that uh, it takes in a collection, in this case a vector of type int. It's passed in by const reference, so this function cannot actually alter the collection at all. It can't take an element of v and make it an L value on the left-hand side of an assignment. Um, all we do here in the for loop, i is a variable that's keeping track of the position in the collection, the current position we're looking at to compare to the target element. So there's a, an element here called value, which is passed in by reference. Um, and it's an element of type int. So we go through the collection starting at index 0 i starts at 0, i is less than v dot size, i plus plus. If the element at index i equals value, I return the index. 
Otherwise, I return negative 1 to indicate after the for loop completely tries every single element. If I still haven't returned anything yet, it cannot be in the collection, so I return negative 1. So a negative 1 return value indicates an invalid index. So you can assume that <laughs> the element was not found in your collection. Okay. Um, so what if the list was sorted? Can we do any better? Right? O of n will not be very pleasant if n is very large. We want to be able to find things quickly in this day and age, especially because we have all this data and we have to organize it very efficiently and find specific things like specific web pages in a, a really large collection of web pages. So how do we find things very quickly? Um, if our lists were sorted from the beginning, that gives us an added advantage because we have a little bit more information about our collection with respect to the thing we're looking for, the uh, value. So what we can do is if we check to see, um, we basically start always, we always start at the middle of the collection. So we take the average of the first index and the last index and that gives us the middle index, okay, using integer division. We take the first index, so if this is a collection of size 15, let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that's 15 elements because we started counting at 0. I take their average, 0 plus 14 over 2, that's 7. So index 7 is the middle index. So I compare my thing I'm searching for to the element at the middle index. If it is not the middle element, then I compare it to see if it's smaller or bigger than the middle element. If it's smaller than the bigger element, the middle element, then I can assume that it's in the left half. If it's bigger than the middle element, I can assume it's in the right half. So I can always eliminate half the possibilities at every stage of the search. This is called binary search. Okay? So in order to implement this binary search algorithm, we need recursion. So we basically just, all we do is we find the middle element, the one in index 7, 0, 1, 2, 3, oh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We compare 7 to 5. We're looking for 5. Is 5 equal to 7? No. So we either recursively perform binary search on the left half, all of these elements before 7, or recursively search on the right half, all of these elements after 7. Right? And that always gives us a very quick way of finding the element if it exists because we're always having the size of our problem at each stage by trying to solve a similar problem on a vector of size n over 2 each time of half the size. So this is a, a, a classic recursion problem. So let's take a look at an example. I guess uh, Professor DeSalvo loves Star Wars. This is a quote from, well, it's a play on the quote from Star Wars. So Han Solo's yelling at Chewbacca. He's like, laugh it up, fuzzball. So this is half it up, fuzzball. So that would be important to explain the jokes, too, in case you've never seen the original Star Wars trilogy. OK. So, um, OK, so just like I said before, we're looking for number five in the collection. And we have a sorted array of ints. And we start with the middle element, the one in index seven, uh, which is actually the value seven, <laughs> coincidentally. So um, since 7 is the middle value and 5 is less than 7, we can forget about all the elements to the right of the middle, va middle value and do a, a binary search, so the same exact problem on a smaller array, the one that ranges from indices 0 through 6. So I have 1, 3, 3, 4, 5, and then two sevens, because the middle element is the third 7. So now I test to see what the middle element is here. So I have an array of size 7. So if I look at 0 plus 7 over 2, that gives me three with integer division, right? So the middle index is at index three. The element, the middle element is four. You see it in blue. So I compare five to four. And is four smaller than five or bigger than five? Is it equal to five first? No. So I look at the left half. If it's smaller than five, I'm sorry. If, I'm sorry. So five, you compare the middle element to five. Is the middle element smaller? Yes. So I have to search the right half, right? If the middle element were bigger, I'd have to search the left half. So I can forget about the 1, 3, and the 3, and then focus on the 5, 7, and 7. I can throw away the 4 also, because I already tested the middle element. OK. So then I am searching. The middle element now is, let's see, um, the indices are um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So 4, 5, and 6. What's the middle index? 6 plus 4 over 2, which is 5. So the element index 5 um, is 7. Okay. So I compare the first 7. So then I compare the first 7 to 5. Is the middle element equal to target? No. 
is the target smaller than the middle element? Yes. Right? The target's smaller. So I search the left half. OK. So then the, la the left half is just the, the single element 5. OK. Now, 5 is the target. So at this stage, I either found my target value or I didn't. <laughs> In this case, I got lucky. I found it. So I return the index of that element. Or I return true or false if I just care about um, whether I found it or not. Okay. So um, if I wanted to calculate the index, here we go. So we started originally at 15 numbers. Our middle index was 14 plus 0 over 2. I averaged the left and right endpoints and then use integer division. The result is 7. Then we um, search the bottom, the first half or the bottom half. So then I get indices from 0 through 6. So I take the middle of that. I get 3. Now my target's bigger. Um, so I, at that point, so I check the top half of this smaller array. And then I notice that uh, the middle element of this smaller subarray is five, index 5. And it turns out that at index, I'm sorry, index 4, let's say left half of class indices 4 through 6. So if I look at the middle index, I get 4 plus 6 over 2, which is 5. So I test the element index 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and I note my target is s smaller than the middle element. So I check the bottom half of that. That's this one. And so the um, middle index, so if the smaller half is just the subarray with index 4, one element with index 4. So that's why um, we can compute the indices this way. So um, OK. So as we label all the indices of that original sorted array on top, you can actually see in the first uh, level of recursion, uh, we look at the, we recursively search the first half, the bottom half, then we recursively search the upper half of the, of the previous array, and then the bottom half of that previous array. So there's actually a way for us to figure out the index by, um, coming up with a number system where we, a system where we denote a 1 for searching the top half and then 0 for searching the bottom half. So we're essentially organizing the array as a tree structure. And by comparing the nodes in the tree, we go, if we go to the right, we, we um, introduce a 1 to the sequence. If we go to the left, we introduce a 0. And if we look at the, if we use those as weights for the size of the, um, the size of the subarrays that we're looking at, so at first, we're looking at 14 over 2 elements. That's the top half, um, and then uh, the, on the first half. And then we look at the right half of the next subarray. So that's 14 over 4. Then we go left, but that has a subarray of size 14 over 8. And then the last subarray has size 1, and we, go, and we went to the right. Um, if, or we use 1 if we are right on the target, if it's the middle element. So by summing up all of these values, we get the index of the element we're looking for. OK? So we use 0 if we move to the left, if we check the left half. We use 1 if we check the right half of the previous subarray. And we weight each choice by the size of the subarray we're looking at. Um, or we use 1 if we are just checking the middle and the target is the middle. OK? So this is very similar to what we call binary expansion, but we only have 15 elements in the array, which is not an exact power of 2. Um, so. Here's the code for binary search, and it's very simple. Um, the first thing you have to worry about is if the from, we have a collection v, which we're passing in by reference. It's a vector of ints. We have an index that we start looking at, the index of the subarray we're first considering, the last index of the array we're considering, and the value we're looking for. Okay? All of these are reference parameters. Now, what we do here is we get the midpoint. Uh, first, we check to make sure that the starting index is at least the value of the large in, the ending index. If it's not, then the element doesn't exist in the collection. So this is a base case for the recursion. So a base case is the case which forces the recursion to stop. It's a way to solve the problem without having to try to solve the problem on a smaller size, the exact same method on a smaller size. So I don't need to call binary search to handle this case. It's the base case. So if, the, if it turns out that when I look at the array, um, the starting index of the subarray is bigger than the ending index, there is nothing to look at. 
right? There is no array, subarray to look at. It's not a well-defined subarray, so our, our target cannot be in that subarray because it's not a well-defined subarray. That's a base case. Then we calculate the midpoint. We take the average of the starting and ending indices, divide by two using integer division. We check if the middle element is equal to the value, the target value. If it is, we return the middle index. Otherwise, if the value is bigger, we call binary search recursively on the second half. So we omit the midpoint as the start. We go one past the midpoint, the middle index, and start there. That's how we can get to the point where the start is bigger than the end. If we get a situation where we have an array of size 1, and then we call this recursively, um, what would happen is the start would be one more than the end. And that would eventually bring us to the base case. Okay? So we call binary search on the vector v, starting at index mid plus 1, ending at the ending index 2, and passing in value to look for value. Otherwise, we know that the midpoint element is going to be bigger than the value, so we um, we have to look at the left half. So we start at the beginning as we did before and we go up to and including one before the mid. We don't consider the mid because we've already checked up here. We can ignore it, we can throw out mid out of consideration. Okay. So we just keep looking at the upper half if the midpoint element is smaller um, or we search the right, I'm sorry, we search the right half if value is bigger than the mid or or we search the left half if value is smaller than the mid, recursively. So um, let's try to analyze the cost of binary search. So if you talked about algorithm analysis a little bit in big O notation with Professor DeSalvo. So if we want to count the number of uh, statements or operations we need to solve, to, find, um, to solve the problem of finding an element using binary search on an array or vector of size n, um, we can express that amount, that number of operations, in terms of the number of operations on a smaller problem of exactly the same type, calling binary search on an array of size n over 2. So that's what we call a recurrence relation. Okay? So the number of statements I need to solve binary search on an, a vector of size n is basically just 1 plus the number of statements I have to make on a vector of size n over 2. This is called the recurrence relation. If I can define my number of operations binary search requires to find an, find an element in a vector of size n. Okay, so basically I have to do one comparison this is the comparing value to v min. Okay, so that one statement for comparing the value to v min, and then I, if it's not that value, I have to check recursively one of the halves. So I basically do binary search on an array of size n over 2. So what I want to do is find what they call a closed formula for t of n. So basically find a formula that um, doesn't have any t of any smaller n's inside. So it's just some expression that depends on n that doesn't involve t of n. What I want to do is basically unravel this. So I want to replace t of n over 2 by its recurrence relation. So um, what I like to do is um, replace this by an expression that involves values of t on smaller n. So keep doing that until I hit the base case. The base case being um, t of 1, which is doing binary search on an array of size 1. So let's just see how this would pan out. The first time, so if I have t of n, 1 plus t of n over 2, so I take this and I want to replace it by t of n over 4 plus 1. So I want to substitute t of n over 4 plus 1 there, right? Which gives me t of n over 4 plus 2, right? So t of n, I can think of it as t of n over 4 plus 2. This is a different recurrence relation. And then I want to replace t of n over 4 with a t of some smaller n, okay? So basically I want to keep doing this until I get to t of 1. Because then I don't have a t, 
an expression that depends on n anymore. I want to eliminate the dependence on n here. And if I have n enough, if I divide n by enough powers of 2, so you can see that if I keep repeating this, I'm going to get an expression of this form. Because every time I divide n by another power of, of 2, I introduce another 1, which contributes to the k minus 1. Right? So here, you can see this is the same thing as t of n over 2 squared plus, um, plus 2. Right? So the, the, the 2 here is the same as the 2 here. Every time I divide n by another 2, I int introduce another 1 here. So t of n over k, t of n over 2 to the k plus k is a formula for t of n. Now if we assume that n is a power of 2, a perfect power of 2, like 2 to the m, then um, I can say even a bit more. All right? So if we assume that m is 2 to the little m, okay, where m is log base 2 of n, it's the exponent of 2 that gives me n, okay? then I can replace, um, I know that t of n, t of n is equal to um, t of n over 2 to the m plus m. But n equals 2 to the m, so this is t of 1 plus m is log base 2 of n. So I have an expression. Now the base case is there's only one element to check, in which case I just check the middle element and either return that index or I return negative 1, right? So this is going to be 1. This is the base case. So all I do in the base case is test the middle element. And if it is the target, great. If it's not, I return some other value that's not a valid index. So this is going to be 1 plus log base 2 of n. Now, log base 2 of n is actually a multiple of natural log using the change of base formula. Log base 2 of n is equal to log n over log 2. So it's some constant multiple, some constant multiple of log of n. Okay? So this is O of log n. It's logarithmic time. Okay? And usually this is a very fast way of searching. Because log of n grows very really slow with respect to n. You need really large values of n um, to make log of n big um, versus um, linear time where we were doing sequential search. O of n is a lot bigger than O of log n. So it's a worse running time if you, the higher, the, the, the faster the function grows, the worse your performance is going to be. Okay? Now, um, I just want to sum up all of the different facts that we know. Um, if we want to do a linear search, that's an algorithm that requires O of n operations. If we want to sort an array, that's O of n log n. Why? Because we can use merge sort, which in any case is n log of order n log n. Right? Have you seen merge sort with Professor DeSavo? OK. So we'll take the best sort we can find. Um, actually, radix sort's better. It's O of n, but you need a lot of space if n is large. You need a space to hold all of the different elements you're sorting. And you need a vec uh, 10 vectors to hold those elements. So there's a lot of memory requirement. But all-purpose sorting, merge sort's the best one you can probably use. That works in general. Um, OK, so if I want to search a sorted list, that's a list that's already sorted, that's logarithmic time. That's O of log n. So um, what should we do? Should we just? Should we take the time to sort our array first, or our vector, and then do a binary search? That seems to be the best course of action, because we only have to sort the array once. So we only have to do a finite number of steps to sort the array. Once the array is sorted, then searching is very quickly. It's O of log n. It's logarithmic time. So it pays to sort first and then search if the list is ordered, if the list can be ordered. Okay. Um, so if you only have to do one or two searches, then you don't have to worry about sorting the whole thing. You could probably just get away with a linear search and be fine, especially if your array is small. But if you are going to be doing a lot of searches, it, it definitely behooves you to sort the list first. Okay? I know the sorting seems expensive, n log n seems expensive, but if you're only doing it once, it's not so bad. 
And then you have the array sorted or vector sorted and then searching becomes very, very instantaneous. Um, so um, hopefully not hating me, uh, but there's a built-in set of algorithms that does all those things that you've learned in class already. There's an algorithm library. So you can do binary search using the built-in functionality of C++. There's a library called algorithms. And in the algorithm library, you can actually do binary search. You can do uh, sort. You can sort an array. Um, so you don't have to create these algorithms yourself and define them. Um, but in our class, or in Professor DeSalvo's class, you're going to have to learn the different ways of sorting, different ways of searching, and comparing the performances of those algorithms because um, eventually you're going to get to a point where you have to code up your own algorithms, like Professor DeSalvo did for his thesis. Um, you have to be able to understand that um, even though there's more than one way of doing something in C++, you have to be careful about um, the way you do something because you may try to do something a certain way, but it may not fit the parameters of your problem. You may have a really large array and doing something like um, bubble sort or um, insertion sort or selection sort may not be the best option because those run in O of n squared time on average and in worst case. So you don't want to use an O of n squared algorithm on a collection that's really, really large because it's going to take up a lot of time and you may not get your results for days and days and days if your n is very, very large. Um, so it's important that you understand the differences in performance so that when you make up your own algorithms, you can ask yourself, is there a faster way of doing this? Um, so um, here's the a library you want to include if you want to use the C++ functionality for sort and linear ser binary search. So there are other algorithms also present. Um, so let me just show you some uh, example code, which allows you to perform a sort on an array of ints. So here, don't forget, we have to include the algorithm library. I define an array using an initializer list for an array that's of size 0, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 elements, okay? The sort function is part of the algorithm library, so I can pass in two pointers into sort. The first pointer, pointers can represent positions in a collection, right? Have you seen linked lists before in C++? As Professor DeSavo, I guess we're going to talk about that later, so. Um, Sort requires two pieces of information, where to start sorting, where to end sorting, right? So it only sorts a sub-array of the array that you pass in, okay? What does it need? It needs a pointer to the element you want to start at, okay, which is the name of the array. Remember, the name of the array is actually a pointer to the element of ARR at index 0, right? So this is a pointer. The name ARR is a pointer to the element at index 0, the 4. So I want to start sorting at this position and stop nine elements later. So let's see. Um, array plus nine is the element at index nine, which doesn't exist because there are nine elements, and they are indexed zero through eight. But this is the pointer to the element after the last element you want to include in the sort. So you don't include the, you don't want to do array plus eight, which is the last index of the array. You want to go past that one. OK, so you always want to stop at the element after the last element. Okay, so that's what the sort is supposed to do. So this is an address of something that may not exist. It's the address of, of whatever address comes after the last int in the array. Okay, now in the for loop, I'm going to print out all of the elements of that array and see them all sorted. So you can try this code out yourself and verify that it does actually sort the array ARR using whatever algorithm it finds it deems the fastest for that particular problem. Okay. So the key is to use pointers when you sort an array using the built-in library. The pointer to the element you want to start at and the pointer to the element after the last element you want to finish at. So this is not an inclusive end. This is the end after, the one after the inclusive end. And you've seen pointer arithmetic before. So this is an offset. This is actually nine, nine um, chunks of memory. So the nine elements passed. So whatever, you know, an int is what is it, uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, two bytes or four bytes. I think it depends on the machine, but um, it'll basically move nine times four bytes past. So each, if each one is occupying four bytes, it'll move nine times four bytes past the element index zero. So four bytes, 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 and then stops before the four bytes here. 
Okay, so that's what the nine, the plus nine does. Okay, so um, now what does it use for an order? Well, ints uses the less than by default. But if you want to define your own ordering, maybe you want to sort them in descending order instead of ascending order. You can define your own comparison function. A comparison function should take in two values of a specific type and return either 0 or 1 depending on whether the first guy is less than the second guy according to your ordering. So you can define a less than being A less than B if A is bigger than B. So that's what we call the reverse ordering. So you can do something like this. You can define So you can do like an, uh, I guess, so bool less than. So, and then it takes in two const ints by reference. OK, and so if this returns 0 if b comes before a. So whatever we would def we're going to define less than to be a less than b if and only if um, a minus b is bigger than 0. So that's how we're going to define it. It's the reverse ordering. So is 3 less than 5? No. OK. So what we do is we just return um, b, um, a minus b uh, bigger than 0. So that could be an example of this is a bool. So it'll return 0 or 1, true or, uh, false or true. right? So we can make this, so if we use this as our comparison function, we can sort elements in descending order instead of going from the lowest element to the highest element. So we, this is essentially reversing the usual ordering um, that we place on ints. So um, the only difference is here I define my array. I, sort, I call the sort function. This is the pointer to the element I start at, the one at index 0. This is the pointer to the element at index 10 or index 9, the 10th element, which doesn't exist. It's the one after the last. Um, and then I pass in the name of the function less than. Have you talked about function pointers with Professor DeSalvo? OK. So just as the name of the array is a pointer to the element at index 0, the name of a function is actually a pointer to the area in memory of where the code for the function is defined in this special area of memory called code memory. So the idea is that pointer variables are just like ordinary variables. They hold addresses of things. A pointer variable for ints, if I do like int pointer a, um, or int pointer p, right? That's a, that's a variable that holds the address of you know, some other variable. I can do p, if I do int a, gets 3. And I can do p gets the address of a, right? So here's a with value 3, and p is pointing to a. If a lives at address 100, p is holding the value 100, right? Well, if you have a function pointer, the name of the function is actually a pointer. It's the memory address. It represents the memory address of the location in code memory of where this function is loaded into memory and defined. OK, so when you load a C++ function, when you execute it, when you run it, the, comp the processor takes all of the machine language for all of the functions in, this, in the exe file and loads it into code memory. And all of that area is just another area of memory that you have to deal with. It's all indexed. It's all, it all has ad, every location has an address there. And so like the, every function, even main, has an address in code memory. So the name of the function tells you where the function lives in code memory. That's all. So you're basically telling sort to use this function as its, um, as its way of comparing a and b. So it'll return, it'll sort things according to this less than ordering. So if I reverse the ordering like I do here, right, I can do, or I can do return a bigger than b, right? It's another way to see it, return a bigger than b. So if I want to define less than to mean actually greater than, I can reverse the ordering of the sort. So I'll have the higher elements first and the lower ornaments at the end, OK? So I just pass in, just as before, the, the pointer to the zeroth element, the pointer to the element after the last element that I want to sort. And then the, the name of the function I want to use as the um, definition of less than. OK? So I pass all of that in. It does the sort for me. And I just print out the array. And you'll see 
if I use that definition, all the elements will be in decreasing order, not increasing order. Okay? Whereas in the example I did before, they were all in increasing order. Okay. So um, Professor Gustavo did even another example of an ordering. Um, so he defined less than to, instead of comparing A and B, he, he actually compares the sine of A to the sine of B. So it returns true if the sine of the first argument is less than the sine of the second in terms of doubles, right? So he defines sine of A to be sine of, he casts A to a double because sine requires a double as input. And then he does the same thing for the second, argu for the second parameter B, gets the sine of that argument, and then returns sine A less than sine B. So you can define your own ordering however way you see fit and pass that name into the sort um, just like you did before in the last slide. Okay? So, uh, so far, are there any questions to anything? Okay. So um, you can also sort, besides arrays, you can also sort vectors. Um, for example, I create a vector of ints here. And of course, I'm including algorithm and vector because I'm using vector. I add all these elements to the end of the vector, push back four, five. So it's essentially doing the same thing as we did in the other code, except now my underlying data structure is a vector, not an array. So I have my, my vector v, and then I'm adding 4, and then I add, let's see, 5, 5, 1, 2, 2, and 13, and then 9. So I have a vector of size 9, uh, vector of size 8, right? Let's see, 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, size 8, yeah. And I sort. Um, now v dot begin and v dot end return positions in the collection as well, although those positions are called iterators. <laughs> so instead of pointers keeping track of the position of every element in the collection, these special objects called iterators, which are basically objects that contain pointers. So pointers, as we know in 10a and 10b, are very dangerous. You can assign a pointer the value of any pointy you want. If you don't initialize the pointer and use it, that's a syntax error because you could inadvertently execute code at any area of memory you want with pointers. So they're very dangerous objects. But if you put your pointers inside of objects called iterators, the movement of the pointers is very predictable because the object manages the pointers for you. The iterator keeps track of the pointer internally. It encapsulates the pointer so that users of this, users of this uh, library and of this function um, do not redirect the pointers to places they're not supposed to go. So the pointers move in a very predictable fashion. They either move to the next element of the collection or back one element to the previous, back, um, previous, to the previous element of the collection. So the pointers can only go forward one or back one at each stage of movement. So they're very predictable. So OK, I, so v.begin gives me the, um, the iterator or the position at the in element at index 0. And v.n gives me the position of the element the la past the last element. So this is the position of the element after the last element in the collection that I'm trying to sort. Okay, so it's like the ARR plus 9, the, a the analog of ARR plus 9. And I just do a for loop, and I print all the elements of the vector here. And then you'll see that the array is sorted according to um, the usual less than ordering, because I didn't specify, I didn't pass in a function pointer to a function which defines the ordering for the sort function. But you can prescribe that function if you want. You define it and then pass the name inside of the sort as the third argument. OK? Questions about that? No. OK. Um, you can also do binary search using the algorithm library. So once you sort a collection, uh, like we did in the last slide, um, I can test to see if a particular value is in my collection. So I can perform binary search. So there's a function called binary underscore search. Uh, v dot begin, again, it returns an iterator or a generalized pointer, an object that contains a pointer to the element at index 0 of the vector. And v dot end contains a pointer to the place after the last element that I want to sort in the range of elements I want to sort. And 12 is the value I'm searching for. So then it performs a binary search and returns a true or false based on whether 12 is in the collection or not. So if I look at my collection, as suggested by Professor DeSalvo, there's no 12. 
So binary search will, will return false. So found 12 will return false. So you'll see when it compares found 12 in the, in the if statement, this will be false. So it'll print out 12 is not in the list. Um, now, one thing you have to be careful of if you use these tools like binary search, you have to make sure the vector or the array is sorted beforehand. If it's not, you're going to get a runtime error. Okay? Um, also, if you use your, uh, um, a particular function, if you prescribe your own ordering, like you do here using the less than function we defined, um, make sure that uh, you pass it into the sort. Okay? And the, and the sort will actually use your definition of less than in its algorithm for ordering the elements of the collection. Um, so here's how you would prescribe, oh, I want to use my ordering, the one that compares the signs of the values of A and B. So order them by output of sign. The smaller sign values will be first in the collection, and the, larger, the elements with the larger sign values will be um, the end elements of the collection. Right? So the elements will be ordered in terms of whose signs are getting larger. Okay? So that's binary search using the standard library. OK. So I'd like to continue our uh, discussion. So we've talked about arrays and we've talked about vectors, but um, you're going to be introduced to an entirely new data structure called a list. Um, and we'll see why this data structure is more appropriate for certain, handling certain problems that involve a collection of data. OK? So. So vectors are really nice for storing a collection of objects if you don't care about inserting elements into a collection at specific positions or removing elements in the collection at specific positions. If all you want to do is look up things at random indices, then this is a really nice collection to use because looking up elements is constant time in terms of an algorithm. You just do v bracket whatever index, close bracket, right? So it's really quick to, um, to access elements using vectors. And the reason why is because vectors um, store their elements like arrays do internally. Every element is in its own cubby hole in memory, and each cubby hole is adjacent to the next one. So all the elements are together in a row. It's like getting three seats at a game, at a, at a basketball game or a football game, and they're all in the same row. So like if you had an array of size three, the compiler will assign, or the processor will assign you, you know, element zero, element one, element two. Okay? So vectors also store their, their data consecutively like that in memory. So every element is adjacent to the next, like if they were neighbors on a street. Okay? So it makes it very easy to compute um, or locate elements at certain indices because you just have to take the size of the element and then shift by that, um, that many bytes each time. So if I want to find the second element, I take two times the size of one element, right? Like we were talking about before, four bytes, whatever. Okay? Or two bytes. OK, so um, so just as the slide said, and as I was explaining, vectors store their elements like arrays do. Like you see, this element is at index, say, 100. This one lives at index 104 if each one is four bytes long. OK, so this one lives at 104. I can guess which one this one lives at, 108, right? And then 112, 116, they all live next to each other in order. There's no gap between consecutive elements in memory. Okay? Where, the, where one element ends, the next element begins. Okay? They all differ by four bytes, whatever the size of an int is in your computer. All right? Now, um, you can actually verify this by doing a for loop on a vector and printing out the addresses of every element. So you can do, you can see out, you can do a for loop and, and just do C out address V bracket I. And you can see where they all live and how they all differ. OK? OK, so um, this is why accessing elements in a vector or an array is very easy. Because you, can, you don't have to visit um, every element in order. You just have to know what index to deal with. So I want to find that I want to index 5. I just shift over by 5 times 4. I shift over by 20. So the element index 5, oh, I just take 100, I add it to 5 times 4. So 104, 108, 12, 16, 120. OK, so I just multiply 5 times 4 
bytes, right? So this is 100 plus 20, right? Or plus 5 times 4. There we go. Okay. So this is, the, so that's how you access elements. You use arithmetic to figure out what element you need to deal with. But if you want to add elements to your collection at a certain location, if I want to insert like a 7 between the 5 and the 1, it's a real pain because arrays cannot be resized. But if you have a vector, they can be resized too. But you can't, sh you know, you have to shift everybody over, right? There are a lot of different ways of, there are a couple of different ways of adding an element in the middle of a collection or at the beginning. Um, but it's more work than just doing V bracket whatever. So if I want to insert um, an element in a collection, how would we do that? Or how would we delete an element in a collection? Let's say we have six contiguous blocks of memory. Okay, This could be an array or a vector. Okay? Um, and I want to delete the element at index 3. So I can, if this were a vector, I can use pop back to remove the last element. So I can remove the 6, the 5, the 4, and then the 3. And then I have to remember to add the 4, 5, and 6 back in that order. So it's a real pain to remove things in the middle of a collection using a vector. Because the vector only gives you one way of removing something, removing the end. Okay, so the last thing you remove, you add, is the first thing you can remove. Okay, so deleting the third element, or the one at index 3, involves, let's see, let's count. So we'd have to delete, we'd have to remove four elements and then add three back. That's an expensive operation, okay? We'd like a data structure that has constant time insertion or removal. So if I, if I know the positions of where I want to remove something, I want to be able to remove it or add a new element in between two consecutive elements with a constant number of operations. That's um, independent of how big the array or collection is. Okay. So um, if I want to delete one in the middle, another thing I could do is I could, I could basically shift um, I, can, I can write over element 3, I can make element 3 th the value of element 4. So I can basically just shift, um, I, can, I can put the value of 4 into 3, and then the value of 5 into 4, and then the value of 6 into 5, and then the value of 7 into 6, and then just delete this guy. So that's another way to do it, which is also kind of expensive. That's an O of N operation as well, right? So insertion and removal is expensive with arrays and vectors. It's O of N for either of those things. See, I, I, I overwrite element of index 3 with the element of index 4, and I'm basically shifting the element of index 6, or 5 into index 4, and then 6 into 5, and then 7 into 6, and then I delete 7. So it's the same idea. So I can do it that way also. Okay. So instead of popping off, all the elements until the, until the element I care about deleting, and then adding all the elements after the element I wanted to delete, like the first example, which requires extra storage. I can do it this way, which doesn't require extra storage. But I still have to do the shifting of the elements over by one, overriding the element I want to delete. So I don't really move any memory. I just shift the data over by one, up to the point where I want to erase, and then delete the last element because I no longer need it. Okay? But that's an O of N operation, too. Um, if you want to insert, well, what do I do? I, I have to do the same thing. I'd have to add one to the end and then shift everybody over. But shifting everybody over by one that I have to shift over is an O of N operation as well. So inserting into a vector at a specific position or removing an element from a vector at a specific position is expensive. It's O of N. But accessing an element in an array or vector is really nice. It's O of 1. It's constant time. So accessing, easy, fast. Removing or inserting takes forever, O of n. Think of n really large, right? So what do I do? I need a new data structure. If I'm going to be adding, if I'm not just searching for records in a collection, but I have to add records into a collection, into a database, and remove records from a database, um, I want a data structure that allows me to insert anywhere I want an element at any position really quickly, constant time, or removes an element really quickly if I know the position of where I want to remove. So given the location of what I, where I want to insert or remove, I want to be able to insert and remove fast, 
constant time, right? Which is not feasible with arrays and vectors. So we need a new data structure to do this. That's where linked lists come in. Linked lists have the properties of the data structure we want. We want to be able to insert and remove quickly. And accessing elements may take forever, but let's envision we have a problem where we don't have to access many records. We just have to put things in or take things out a lot of the time. Okay? Um, so a linked list, a way to envision a linked list is like a scavenger hunt. Okay? You have um, a bunch of locations you have to find. Okay? So you go to the first location, it has some information, and also a clue for getting to the next location. So then once you find out the clue for the next location, you go, you figure out the clue, and you go to where the next location is. And at that next location, you have more information and then a clue for stop number three. So all of the elements in the collection are linked to each other like links in a chain. And every element knows how to get to the element next, the next element. Okay? That's a linked list. And that's all the time we have today. So we'll pick up the, uh, this is a good stopping point. So on Friday, we'll start with linked lists and draw you some pictures so you can really see what the linked list looks like and explain to you why insertion and removal is very, quickly, very quick with linked lists as opposed to vectors and arrays. So we'll pick this up on Friday. Have a great day, everybody.